Well, good evening. We're glad that you are here. There's a few more that aren't here yet. This is really loud. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back and adjust it. It's not that loud. Well, it is when I get up by that speaker and start squealing in my ear. <laughs> That's the thing. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. That's a little bit better. Because I talk pretty loud anyway. But we're recording, so there's some people that couldn't be here, so we're recording. And they want to make sure that got my voice... Mm -hmm. You hear that? I got right underneath that speaker. That's bad. So if you haven't logged in to slido.com, you can do that with LR1. And uh, I'm getting texted all over the place. Oh, Chris May just pulled up. Good. <laughs> I'm glad you did. All right, so we've been, some of you got 15 people have taken the poll. So we're going to go to see the results of the poll. Um, let's see if I can get this to show up. Nope. Well, Got to do it over here. Might need you to help me out. <laughs> it was doing it earlier. So I want to see what you guys said. And by the way, we'll, as we go through the next session, this, this session, we'll, um, if you have questions and answers and so forth, uh, questions especially. All right, here we go. Who do you think will win the World Series this year? So 53% uh, are wrong. Um, <laughs> sorry. I'm only going off on Red Sox because they trounced, I, I, LA Dodgers when they were here trounced Atlanta so badly. I still haven't, I, I, hey, you're talking about my Braves, okay? All right. If you could describe in one word how a real Christian can be spotted on your campus, what would that word be? Helpful attitude, authentic, countenance, loving, modest, kind, enlightened. Via dress or how they speak? Can't. Wow. Actions. <laughs> loving, accepting, happy, compassion, genuine, cheerful. If you could describe in one word what God means to you, in one or two words, what would you say? Father, living, loving, powerful, giver, loving companion, my rock, salvation, my life, merciful, peace, wonderful, reliable life, marvelous Savior, my Savior, protector, helper, love, loving and merciful. Awesome. Now we're getting into leadership. What do you think is the most important trait you look for in a leader. Now, these get bigger, by the way, the more people that answer with that particular word. Notice confidence, humility, mentoring, follow, brave, honest, lead, consistency, authenticity. Keeps changing all the time. How cool is that? I lost my place. You can read them. <laughs> I was, I was tracking pretty good there for a minute. All right. What makes you trust a leader enough to follow them? Sincerity, honesty, vulnerability, their faith and intellect. When they're caring and show they're genuine. Being willing to discuss issues. Wow. Let me see if I can keep this going. Is that, is that going up or No. Well, it goes on. It says, uh, being willing to discuss issues and see reason. Commitment, when I know they're taking their position seriously. If he or she has a good connection with God, if they're loyal, honest, forthcoming, dedicated, I trust a leader that listens. If she informs us of everything, consistency, they keep their promise, 
promises and are ready to help their team members when a need arises. Good organization skills and respect they have for their members. Genuine care for me and the team. Their courage to accept their faults and be willing to learn how to not let their faults hold them back in life. The willingness to listen to input while directing the attention when necessary. Good answers. Um, one thing I hope to take away from this weekend. Confidence. Hope. Ideas to help my campus. I find more of my purpose in life. How to be more outgoing and confident. How to strengthen our group. More money. <laughs> yeah, that was the one right at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, and we'll tell you how to do that. A stronger bond with God. Becoming a better leader. Better example of those around me. Learning how to reach out to people to invite them to events. How to lead my ACF chapter to do evangelism and learn to connect with non-Christians. How to grow as a leader in my group. Resources. Learn more about my position in ACF and how I can use it to help other students on campus. Strengthen my leadership skills. Learning to love and serve practically. Courage to make tough decisions in life and leadership role. Continued ability to recognize opportunities to lead, teach, and learn while promoting development and vision of each person. That's pretty cool. We're going to enter this weekend into the whole leadership chapter. Now, I, I made an executive decision on this weekend. I chose not to fly anybody in to be the guest speaker. So you're stuck with me. Yes. But I took that money and put it into jackets for the presidents. Right. So is that okay? Yeah. Good decision. Okay. So now you're not so rough on stuck with me. Okay. But... Uh, the good side is this is in my wheelhouse because I taught leadership for quite a few years. And so I'm going to take you through some stuff about leadership this weekend that will challenge you, um, that will, will hopefully help you. And we're going to spend the first four sessions really delving into what leadership is and isn't. And uh, you saw kind of a thing there where it said... Um, it said that, uh, let's see. There we go. Did that work? No, it didn't. That worked really well. Um, you should be able to go to, on your, on your Slido now, it's got a place that says questions. Okay. Now, if you have a question as we're going, just type it in. Rather than raising your hand, just go ahead and type your question in. As you type your question in, you can upvote that question. So if you see questions that come across your screen from somebody else, and you say, oh, that's a question I have, upvote it. And it'll go to the top. And then the top three will be on the screen at all times. When we get done with the session, after our discussion time, then we'll go to Q&A, and we'll try to answer the questions that are on the screen. Fair enough? We'll go for a little while, and then uh, we'll, we'll work on from that. Now, any time during the, the session that you have a, um, a question, just go right to there. Before we start tonight and get into it deeply... Uh, Ken Rogers is our Southern Union Youth and Young Adult Director and ACF, and uh, he has decided to come and hang out with us tonight, and I think that's pretty amazing because this guy could be anywhere in the Union, which we have eight or nine states. How many conferences? Eight. Eight. Eight conferences in this Union, and he is Youth Director, Young Adult Director for all of those, and of all the places he could be tonight... He chose to be with you. So that's cool. I've asked Ken to open us with a word of prayer. Father God, we're grateful for your love and your goodness to us. Thanks for the privilege and opportunity to be here. Thank you for protection and safety and travel. Bless those who might still also be on their way. Rainy night. Slick roads. But uh, we're glad to be here. We want to first know and love you more. And as we do that through our discussions, Pastor Don's presentations, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, may we be enriched, blessed, encouraged, 
that we might share the love of Jesus on our campuses, our community, and in our lives in a more powerful way. My prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First couple sessions we're going to talk about tonight are sessions that have to do with you as a leader. So tonight we're talking about the iceberg. Now, as you look at this picture, what is it you notice? Most of it is underwater. Pretty phenomenal. So here's the principle, and then we're going to talk about it. The iceberg represents your leadership. The 10% above the water is your skills. The 90% below the water is your character. It's what's below the surface that sinks the ship. Now, when they got to studying the Titanic, they thought it had a huge gash all the way down it. But what they found instead was it had a series of... It's hard to get good help. I'm sorry. <laughs> he starts playing with his phone, and he doesn't know what to do with it. <laughs> they found that it had a series of six small slits that happened to span the six different compartments that were supposed to be watertight. Now, they said if four of those were spanned, it could still float. Five was iffy. Six, obviously, you saw what happened. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the radio operator on the Titanic that night had gotten many uh, radio messages saying, be careful, go slow, there's icebergs in the lane. Now, this was a 47,000 ton ship moving at 21 knots. Imagine how much it takes to get that kind of tonnage moving. And then imagine what kind of power it would take to get that stopped. So they said, look, go slow. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Finally, after the sixth transmission, he said, shut up, I'm busy. About seven minutes later... They got a call from the watch guys. Now, how long did they have from the point in time that they spotted the iceberg until they hit? Anybody know? Well, I knew you wouldn't know. <laughs> so uh, I went back, and that little clip in Titanic... <laughs> Not watching the whole movie, just. <laughs> this is for sake of uh, illustration. Yes, what do you see? Iceberg, run ahead!
Now, what does that tell you about leadership? It's tough. Good call. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll discuss a little bit more tomorrow, but I went ahead and figured you wouldn't tonight anyway. So here's what it tells me. The moment to prepare for a crisis is not at the point of crisis. You won't have time and you will most certainly wreck the ship. Let's talk about that for a minute. Have you seen leaders who come to the point of crisis and fail? Can you think of some? I'm not talking about people in your ACF chapter. Let's not get that, that specific. What about, uh, some of you may be too young to remember this, what about Enron? Get the old people in the room, oh yeah. What about uh, Kobe Bryant? What about uh, Tiger Woods? Are we getting closer? You see, there's a whole lot that goes on below the surface you don't see, and everything looks good. Here's the question. Why do we spend 90% of our time on the 10% above the water? We spend, if you wanted to do it just internal and external, we spend the just 10% that shows, we spend 90% of our time making sure this is ready and very little time making sure this is ready. Are you tracking with me yet? See, we think that as long as it all looks good, people will follow us. The problem is, if all we're worried about is this, when we come to the point of crisis, we can't stop the ship. When we come to the point where we spot the trouble, the iceberg is ahead in the lane, you don't have time to reverse the propellers. Are you with me? The moment to prepare for a crisis is not at the point of the crisis. When we have people in leadership that are trying to hide all this stuff and kind of make it look one way, and then we find out later it was another way, you don't know any leaders like that, do you? Not in our country, of course. Uh, but I digress. When we have leadership in the church that focuses more on the externals than it does the heart of the matter and how they are with God, they're getting to the point of losing it in the crisis. The ship will get wrecked. So, let's take a look at the book. Check out Luke 6, 43 to 45. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit. Nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from a briar bush. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil, for the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. Another version says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So all I have to do is listen to you for a little while, and I know where your heart's at. You know, you know what we're saying, right? Now as you look at this, what stands out to you in that passage? Let's just take a little bit of time, just call it out. What stands out to you in that passage? Nashby. Each tree, each tree is known by its fruit. You know, something may look okay, but if you know the fruit that's being taken from it, which is could be, I don't know, not necessarily the attendance of the church, but how much the people are on fire for Christ, how closer do people feel, you know, for Christ or 
just the good that is coming um, from it with rapid determined, um, you know, if, if what is going on is really truly what it is. Mm. Yeah, somebody else. Um, the very last part for the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. Because no matter like what people see or how you try to portray yourself, people are going to know who you are eventually by what you're saying and like how you end up carrying yourself, I guess, in the end. You know, they may see one thing, but then your true colors are always going to show. Yeah. Somebody else. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, for good men, I have a good question. I'm just going to phrase what, what is good. Um, if you have good intentions, you know, bring forth good. And if you have evil intentions, bring forth evil. Okay, good. Ever seen any churches that had good fruit? I'm not talking about potluck. <laughs> but you walk into that church and it's like, wow. I just want to be here with these people because this is awesome. I just like hanging out with them. You ever seen a church that looks good but isn't? Oh, y'all were too fast on that. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that came out real quick. What is it about that church that turns you off? Talk to me. Once you like see it for its true colors, you realize it's not as good as you thought it was. It's kind of disappointing. Yeah. It's kind of like biting into a mealy apple. It looks really good. I, I don't know, but I hate grainy mealy apples. Mm -hmm. I just hate that. And it looks really good. You bite into that and you're going... It's, it's kind of like lukewarm Sprite. Hot day, you bust open one of those and it just foams in your mouth. You know what I'm saying? It kind of gives you that feeling like... Mm -hmm. When you begin looking at what people do, it's very easy to get judgmental, isn't it? Here's the thing. In leadership, you now have people looking at you. And you might say, well, I'm not a role model. Yes, you are. Like it or not. The very fact that you are here says somebody thought you were a leader. And you might say, yeah, but they were desperate. Okay, fair. I'll give you that. <laughs> We're all desperate at some time. That doesn't mean you're not a leader. As a matter of fact, there's two types of leaders. There's the big leader. They're the ones that you, you see up front and you say, that's a leader. But there's also the small L leader. That's the one that has their sphere of influence because all of us influence somebody. It might just be little siblings, but you're leading in that capacity. And so as you lead, you need to be aware that people are following you, they're watching you, and they're trying to see, is there good fruit or is there bad fruit? God puts being before doing. Man ends up putting doing before being. So we get in a thing and we say, okay, guys, what should we do this year. Every time we start a meeting about ministry, what do we say? So what should we do? What do you guys want to do? And it's kind of like those, uh, those buzzards in the jungle book. What do you guys want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. Don't start that again. You know. <laughs> yeah, my kids watched that movie forever when they were kids. So much so that I'm traumatized and scarred, but therapy's helping. Um, we end up all about what we do, and we say we have an active 
chapter. And we do this. We do this. We do this. When are we going to ask the question, who are we being? That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> well, I'm teaching halfway. God prioritizes taking care on the inside, that is our heart, because that will determine what takes place on the outside, our behaviors. Are you following me? Why is focusing on the inside so difficult for us today? Why do you think so, Avery? I think because the inside, you know, it takes longer for you to see those types of fruits. For instance, if you were to do it like an activity or something, you could say, okay, I did this, but a change of heart or a change of character is like a more gradual process, so it's easier to just, uh, if you want to check something off or see that you're making progress, to do something on the outside. Sure. Focus on appearance rather than character. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes it's as simple as it hurts. As it, like it doesn't feel good to work on the things you know that are not right. Oh, you know, I don't want to go there because that hurts. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, I might run into something I don't really. Well, see, I know what's there, so I just want to leave that alone and back away. See, every time we start looking at ourselves, we see the faults, right? And we say, well, if people really knew who I was, they wouldn't like me. That's almost universal. Did you know that? Just about any country you go to, people have the same exact insecurity. If they knew who I was, they wouldn't like me. And you know what? You're probably right. They probably wouldn't. But... They would have to admit they don't like themselves either. The point is, that cannot be the determining factor for stopping working on ourselves. It's difficult because we run into ourselves and we don't like ourselves in some of those areas. And we refuse to see that we're both darkness and light. See, I want to portray the light part to you because I want you to like me. I don't want you to see the darkness part of me because if you saw that, you wouldn't like me. The cool thing about God is he sees both and he loves you. Amen. What a cool thing is that? It's called grace. Grace. He says, I know your darkness and light. I know you have competing and contrasting urges and, and different things going on in your heart. I understand that sometimes you want to be good and sometimes you don't. I know that sometimes you're in church Sabbath morning all holy and things, and I know you want to get down on Saturday night. You know, just let the sun don't go down. And then, why is it we always get down? You ever thought of that? I don't know. I'm getting down. It's the wrong direction. I'm just saying. We don't just get up. But anyway, why do we put so much emphasis on the outside of our lives? That's the part that people see. Uh, do you see any correlation between the iceberg there? Oh. <laughs> the part that people see it's that tip of the iceberg. But it's the part under here, the character that's going to sink you. Doesn't take a whole lot. Just six little slits. And the boat goes down. So what's the lesson in this for us tonight, guys? What do you think? Well, back at verse 45, it says, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good. That word treasure literally means deposit. What you've placed there. You've put it there on deposit. It's what's held in the deepest part of your heart. Uh, what does the word deposit conjure up in your mind? What do you think of when you hear that word deposit? Deposit. A direct deposit, 
Money. What else? Investment. What else? Oh, like depositing seeds in a garden. Yeah, good. What else? Account. Now, if I'm going to look at this from that perspective, this deposit perspective, and I want to put that verse into my own words. Let's go back there. Take this line here and put that in your own words. Okay? From the good man out of the good treasure of his heart. So let's hear some of you. Just think about that. Try to put that in your own words. And let's hear what you got. Nice guy. Nice guy what? Yeah. So I, I think of it like a good person just naturally does um, what's good because he's invested in himself, like good things, like just, um, you know, reading the Bible, praying. He just has an overflow of things so that it just comes out naturally. Okay. Ken. Thinking about my mom, it was like good in, good out. Garbage in, garbage out. You reap what you sow. All right. Yeah. And your mother camped on that. <laughs> it didn't work. No, I did. <laughs> did. Somebody else. What do you think? How would you, how would you reword that for you? It matters what you do in your alone time. You are, it has been said, who you really are when you're by yourself. When there's nobody to look on. So the question tonight, guys, who are you? How are you with the inside? Take a minute and think about your own character. Now, we're not going to do this out loud because I don't want to embarrass anybody. On a scale of 1 to 10, and maybe you can do it in your little notepad in there if you want, 10 being the strongest, rate yourself in the following areas. Self-discipline, core values, sense of identity, emotional security. So just take a minute and score yourself on those four areas. You can do it on your notepad, or you can do it in your head so that nobody has a record afterwards that they could find. We're going to just be quiet for about three, four minutes and just kind of, kind of score yourself there. Now, I'm not going to ask you your scores, but I am going to ask you why. Why did you score yourself the way you did? Why did you give yourself the scores you did? Maya, you had your hand up. <laughs> just like an auction here, if I just see a movement. <laughs> Sold. I got a lot of things. 
things that need to work on with a lot of these different categories. And I support myself maybe because I'm aware of that and a lot of people in the work. So with that, I kind of just, I gave myself a working score and hope that it will be able to Fair. Good. Okay. Somebody else, why? Why did you score yourself the way you did? Because you're honest with yourself. Good. Learning, you know, and that's a hard thing. Learning to be honest with yourself is really a hard thing. Because we like to fool ourselves sometimes. Have you noticed that we can really go off on the driving skills of the idiot in the car in front of us? But we miss our own. You notice that we can forgive ourselves for making stupid driving mistakes a lot faster than the guy in front of us or behind us? Why is that? Because we haven't really learned to be honest with ourselves. And y'all don't want to ride with me, I'm just saying. <laughs> Especially through Atlanta. I'm just being real. Okay. <laughs> Somebody else, why did you score yourself the way you did? Okay. Daniel? Based on like experiences that I've had, it's like anything that had to do with those core values, I look at the experience and how I responded to it. Just go from there. Yep. Because society pushes me to either go against or for it. Society pushes you to either go against or for it. Sure. Sure. Okay. Now, as young leaders, you all have a sense of moral intelligence. You heard of IQ. This is, well, there's even uh, EQ, which is emotional intelligence, but I'm speaking about the measure of your character. Each one of us has some level of moral intelligence, and, and that a lot of it depends on how you were trained as a child. Some people's parents built that into them. My dad, you could do something wrong and get punished, but if you did something wrong and lied about it, you got punished way worse than if you just said, yeah, I did that. He did not tolerate lying. As a result, I grew up a very honest kid. My sister still lied like a cheap rug, but... <laughs> But she just didn't tend to like, you know, the, the whippings. I don't know. Um, uh, she actually had, a, dad would say, now one of you is lying. And since I can't tell which one, I'm going to whip both of you. And then we get done, we're going to have prayer. And she's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry I lied. <laughs> and like after the fifth time of that, you're going, dad, she does this every stinking time. You know I'm straight as air. I'm, so, I'm sorry I lied. <laughs> so we get to the next time and go, Dad, remember who said she was sorry she lied the last five times? It ain't me. Okay. But here's the thing. You have the capacity to live by the ethical principles you say you believe. We all hold to our principles until the price gets too high. And it's been said that every man, every woman has their price. So consider the following realities about your future. You're going to find you have several unique temptations. Number one, your leadership ability has the potential to carry you further then your character can sustain you. In other words, you have some strengths inside of you that you'll want to use. Your temptation will be to use that strength to go places that your character isn't strong enough to keep you aligned with your ethics and principles. How's that for thought-provoking? Second one. 
Leaders get into trouble when their integrity doesn't keep pace with the momentum created by their natural abilities. Did you track with that one? Let me hit it again. Leaders get into trouble when their integrity doesn't keep pace with the momentum created by their natural abilities. Sometimes our natural talents or gifts are much stronger than our character. Our moral intelligence isn't high enough to maintain healthy direction. Can you think of any movie stars this has happened to? What's that? Oh, well, it doesn't have to be a movie. Any, any other leader or, or public figure? Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. Okay. Give us an example of how that worked for him or didn't work for him. Yeah. He was exposed and he lost everything. Was he talented? Yeah. Absolutely. He was talented, but that talent took him into areas and then he had to keep up the facade. And he knew he had to keep the level, so what did he do? Started cheating. His abilities took him farther than his character could take him. Who else? Can you think of any others? I'm sure you could if we had long enough. We won't tarry. What was, the, what was the girl that played on the parent trap? Lindsay Lohan. Lindsay Lohan. Another classic example right there. If you look at her real life. Number three. There is no correlation between natural abilities and maturity. There is no correlation between natural abilities and maturity. It's easy to assume that someone who is on the platform is certainly a mature and healthy leader. Not true. Uh, Justin Bieber. Many young leaders make it on the platform because of their talent, not because of their character or maturity. A person can have great talents and be the most immature person in the world. Unfortunately, those people can still have influence. Number four, our commitment to integrity can easily be eroded by our love of progress. This is critical to understand. If you feel that you lack integrity, it doesn't mean you're any worse than anyone else. It may mean your natural leadership ability is pushing you forward and you want to make progress, and that's good. Leaders want to go forward, which means... You have to pay special attention to your level of integrity. It's okay to push forward, but take your integrity with you. Are you following me? So here's the, the big deal question. If someone you respected warned you about how a, a potentially damaging habit or behavior in your life, would you change how you're living? If someone you respected warned you about a potentially damaging habit or behavior in your life, would you change how you're living? How many say yes, I would? Okay. You'd try to. Okay. How many say, I don't know. Maybe not. Qualify. Okay, go ahead and qualify, Maya. Okay. Yeah. No, that's fair. Now, um, in 1986 in Conyers, Georgia, bringing this home, y'all, high school officials there discovered 
that one of their basketball players who had played 45 seconds in the first of the school's five postseason games, now he played 45 seconds, had actually been scholastically ineligible. This was the first of their five postseason games, 45 seconds. They discovered this after the championship game was history and they'd won. What did they do in response? Now, had they just swept it under the rug, nobody would have noticed. The student had only appeared once for 45 seconds. It was not that big of a deal, but that's not how they saw it. They returned the state championship trophy they had just won three weeks before. They could have kept quiet and kept the trophy, but they had too much moral intelligence to do that. To their credit, the team and the town, although they were sad, stood behind the school's decision. The coach said, we didn't know he was ineligible at the time, but you've got to do what's honest and right and what the rules say. I told my team that people forget the scores of the games. They don't forget what you're made of. The truth is, in the minds of most people, it didn't matter the championship title was forfeited. The coach and the team were still champions in more ways than one. I only wonder, could each of us have mustered the same courage under similar circumstances to do what they did? Now, what time it is. Uh, Kevin Christian said he's at the front door and doesn't know how to get in. I just pull the door is all you need to do. But <laughs> It's usually locked and you have to ring a doorbell, but we unlocked it tonight and just for, for your uh, viewing pleasure. Uh, be able to get in. Entry. That's good. Now, as we look at this, what are the questions that come to your mind? Okay? Anybody put any questions on here? If you got questions. Let's go there. If there's any We're going to take a, take a break here in a minute. Just type some questions in and let's, uh, let's take a run at it. How can someone make sure they have a decent balance as a leader? Great question. What do you think? How can someone make sure they have a decent balance as a leader? What do you think? Any thoughts on that? Chris? Uh, I would say don't lead from like a vacuum. Have a mentor, whether outside of your sphere of influence or whether inside of your sphere of influence, just to keep you in check to counsel when you make a decision. A lot of times, especially when like uh, something emotional comes up, you might want to be impulsive. So just have someone else to talk to. Um, definitely helps that balance things out. Okay, Danny? Be willing to take input. Yeah. I was just gonna say, be open to criticism, even from like the, like the lowest of members. Yeah. I would say back to fruit. You would know by the effectiveness um, efficiency of your leadership. Uh, are you getting things done? Are people actually going to Christ? You know, just is there a positive outcome coming from however you lead? You know, people 
matter where you are in the spectrum. So, so check what's happening actually in, in the wake of your, your passing. Yeah, sure. I mean, not, not your passing, but <laughs> where you've been. Yeah, Ken. I think I want to really make sure that I'm grounded well and that the, the things that are really important in my spiritual walk with Jesus is, is really solid and then... And Maybe that isn't even in balance. It, it, there's more time spent in that, and that becomes more important than, than what I actually do. So that would presuppose, then, that you actually have a standard by which you measure your life. Where are you going back to for your standard? How, how, how is that working for you? Okay? Um, what if you don't know the crisis is coming? What do you do when it gets here? Going based off of at that point of the crisis is not the time to prepare for it. Okay, I have never yet in my life and leadership uh, had a crisis that uh, actually announced it's coming. <laughs> never. Uh, it just suddenly is there. So the only way to get ready is to live ready. The only way to live ready is to walk daily with Jesus and to answer the one question he asks everyone every day. And that is, will you trust me with what you're facing today right here? That's what he's asking. Will you trust me even here? Okay? And if you trust him there, um, then uh, he will... He'll lead you to the next step. Here's the deal. And Jesus says, will you trust me here? You say, yes. He moves you. Will you trust me here? Yes. He moves you. Will you trust me here? Well, I'm not sure. He takes you in a big circle, just like the children of Israel, back to the same border. Yeah. I think an important part of being prepared for a crisis is not putting off doing something that you can do now for later. Sure. That's right. Now, we are used to early warning systems now, right? Hurricanes coming. And we get three or four or five days to get with it, pull in some water, get out of the country, whatever it is. But crisis doesn't have an early warning system except where your character begins to fail. But if you're not paying attention to the early warning system, guess what? You can't back the ship up. It's going to hit. So, what if you don't know the crisis is coming? You will never know the crisis is coming. I mean, almost never. You might get an early warning system on a few things. But almost never will you know a crisis is coming. And so it means, how do I live with Jesus today? And then today. And then today. Does that make sense? All right. Are you letting these go through, Elise? Are you moderating for me? Okay. Go to incoming. Okay, so let's go to... We got that one already. Okay, how do you determine the leadership potential in others? Great question. What do you think? One of the key things of a good leader is being a good follower. Because if you can't take good advice, how can you do it? Hmm. So a sense of humility is true. Okay, somebody else. Kind of like what we've been talking about all night is like the bottom of the iceberg is their character. Uh, teaching them those skills like on the job training is something that you can do, especially as like new uh, uh, ACF leadership comes in in the spring. Uh, you can teach the skills, but trying to teach someone how to fix their character is a much harder thing to do. So looking at their character, what kind of person are they? Do you know that many people are hired not because of their skill levels, but because of their character? 
They're also fired the same way. I would say, let's go back to good fruit, bad fruit. That's how you know, okay? What if we feel like we have to be perfect before we can lead? Then you will never lead. Um, Let me just put it to you plainly. Scripture says there is none righteous, no, not one. So the good news is you're not perfect. The bad news is you're not perfect. But that means that if you follow Christ and where he leads and you lead people to follow Christ, you're going to be a good leader. You don't have to be a perfect leader. You can mess up. It's okay. Here's the difference between a good leader and a bad leader. When you mess up, don't be afraid to say, my bad. Guys, I messed up. So I was pastoring this church, and we were getting ready to build a building, and we we put out $20,000, which I don't know about y'all, but that's a lot of money to me, (laughs) for this architect to draw up the drawings, bring it back, and then we discovered that they had a little clause in there that said, if you don't use our builder, you can't use our plans. Guess who signed that paper? Guess who didn't read that clause? Guess who had a little church that had taken about five years to get that 20 grand? Guess who felt really, really stupid? How did I deal with that? I had to step up and say, guys, we got some good news and some bad news. We have some plans drawn. Unfortunately, as the building committee has looked at those plans, they're not going to meet our needs. This guy just put a cookie cutter on it and said, there you go. And when I said, no, no, that's not what we want. He says, no, that's all you signed off for. Your 20 grand just went to this. I said, well, we need to adjust that. Well, that'll be another 20 grand. And he pointed out that little phrase, if you don't use our builder, you can't use our plans. Because I was thinking, what? Well, we'll just take the plans and have somebody else design, you know, redesign them. I had to go back to that church and say, you know what, y'all? I didn't read this carefully. I messed up, and I cost y'all 20 grand. And if you want to fire me, I get it. I'll totally start packing my office up now, because I messed up big time. Did they throw me out? Yes. Yes. No, (laughs) they did not. They said, Pastor, we expect you to be our spiritual leader, and there's a lot of businessmen that sit on this panel. We should have caught that. We should have left it for you to do. Let's learn a $20,000 lesson. Let's start over with a whole different company. Let's build a church. If you go out to GCA right now, you'll see a beautiful big church. They didn't kill me over. (laughs) But when you mess up, which you will as a leader, own it. Just say, my bad. I messed up. All right. Should someone who doesn't feel confident in who they are still lead? Yes, but on a little lesser level. In other words, begin where you are and expand. It's never too late to go back and start saying, okay, now I know i got these character things. I'm going to work on those. You know what? It doesn't take a lifetime. I mean, there's a lifetime of living that you can get, but it doesn't take a lifetime to set things in the right path. And if you're following Jesus and you're leading people to follow Jesus, you're on the right path. Does that make sense? How can we avoid or cope with the pressure that comes with leadership? Here's the thing that I've found. I'm going to try to finish these off and then we'll, we'll have our break and refreshments and talk about tomorrow. Here's what I found. 
A lot of the pressure that comes with leadership is self-induced. That is, it's about my perception of the pressure. My perception makes a big difference, and my vision can get distorted when I feel overwhelmed. So when I feel overwhelmed, what do I, what do, I do as a leader? I stop. I disconnect, even for a couple hours. I go off by myself, and I say, Lord, I'm feeling over my head. My vision is distorted. My perspective is skewed. Please renew my vision. And I sit quietly. I disconnect from my phone. I turn it all the way off. Because you know when that thing, even if it's on silent and it buzzes, you go, oh, wait. I will typically go out to a park and just take a walk. And just walk around a park and keep praying. And that's how I cope with the pressure. You can't avoid pressure. It's going to come. You can't avoid pressure. It's going to be there. But you can manage it. Okay? And you manage it the healthiest by taking that and putting it back on Christ. You want to carry it? It'll kill you. Trust me. Been there, done that. Didn't even want the t-shirt. Yeah. And that's how that whole distortion thing happens. It's much bigger. Okay? So, what should a leader do if there is someone they don't get along with, like a team member or their community? Kill them. No. Wrong answer. Sorry. We'll chop that out of the tape. Uh, my bad. Whew. I made a mistake on that one. Back up. No. You will inevitably have conflict. You can't get away from it. Because there's always some idiot in your group. You know, you're always going to have an idiot because they don't think like you. Think about that for a minute. Yeah. One thing I've learned to do or have done, don't always, but it works when I do it. If I can see myself as being that person. Because we're that person at some point in time. So if I can try to see that person from the position I'm in. You know, right. And if I can see that I can be that person, then I can stop thinking about me and think about the situation and where we can find some middle ground to begin to solve whatever the issue is that's causing the problem that I'm having. It may just be my problem, or it may be their problem, or it could be a combination. That's correct. But as soon as I can recognize that I can be the person that causes the conflict with somebody else, I can begin to solve the problem. Yes. Now, there are people who are like you, and there are people who are not like you. I just want to start basic. <laughs> there are people who will like you, and people who will not like you. Are you tracking with me? There are people who are very intelligent. There are people who are dumb as rocks. And you wonder how in the world. And they're the ones that ask the question, could God create a rock so big that not even he could move it? And I want to say, obviously he created a brain so dense. But no. But that wouldn't be nice, so I don't say that. No, here's the deal, guys. When you begin to track with another person, oftentimes check your own perception first. Oftentimes you think ill of that person because they actually exhibit some character traits you have that you don't like. Was that an ouch? <laughs> there are people who are just plain 
ill. <laughs> and I don't care what you try to do, you can't make them happy. There are other people who just want to be in control all the time. And I don't care what you do, sometimes you have to confront them. And so every situation is different, but let me just be real. God called you to be a peacemaker. He called you to be a person who seeks to understand rather than trying to make sure you're understood. Are you tracking with me? God calls you to do everything in your power to live at peace with those among you. Now, that doesn't mean lay down and get rolled over. There are times when I've had to say to a church member, you know, this needs to stop because Galatians 5 says the acts of sinful nature are obvious. And it lists a whole long list. And, and now, one of those is, you know, um, drunkenness and orgies. And we'd say, those people should not be elders, right? And witchcraft should not be elders, right? In the same list, there's dissension, fits of rage, envy. And so when people are continuing to display those kind of things to take control, sometimes they need to be confronted in a Christ-like way. And I've had to say to members, based on Galatians 5, I've worked with you, We've, we've talked three, four times now. Here's your choice. I'm going to make it simple. Either you stop this, take this back to the Lord and have him help you with it, and you put your shoulder at the wheel like everybody else, or find another place to worship, because based on Galatians 5, I have grounds to disfellowship you. And you continue this behavior, I will, because I cannot let you tear up the church. And that particular person in one case, decided that the Lord was calling him to plant the church. So he, he moved on. But point being, there are people who will, who will actually cause strife. But God calls us to be at peace. At the same time, he calls us to be bold. But to make sure that we're coming from the right place ourselves, not just out of anger. It's got to be based on Scripture. Let Scripture do the heavy lifting. Don't try to take that on yourself like you're all that in a bag of chips. All right, last question. Oh, well, we got a few more, just came in. What if you struggle with stubborn pride? Um, if you struggle with stubborn pride, the only place you can get rid of that is at the foot of the cross. Nobody else can take it from you. You have to lay it down. That's a tough one. I'm proud to say I did that. No, that's wrong. How can we learn good decision-making skills, make a lot of bad decisions? <laughs> you think I'm kidding. Um, I have learned more from getting smacked because I made stupid decisions and going, ooh, I'll never do that again. Yeah, you got to own it. You say, my bad, I'm not doing that again. You can make good decision-making skills and... and a, Ways to make decisions. Here's, here's a brief thing, okay? When you're facing a daunting thing and you're trying to figure out how to make a decision, here's a real quick way to do that. First of all, you take a piece of paper and you write down what all could be done. List it out. Then go back and apply biblical principles, scripture, those things, and then you narrow your list down to what should be done. Based on scripture, based on the spiritual principles, this is what I should do. Third step is develop a strategy of how you're going to do that. And the fourth one is get her done. Don't play with it. Make a decision, move forward with it. And if it blows up in your face, that's okay. Back up and say, what did I learn? And start over. Does that make sense? Even as a leader, how do you work on your character when people hold you accountable for making one mistake? Holding you accountable is not a bad thing. Rubbing in your face, that's the problem. But if you try to hide your mistakes, that's when they continue to rub it in your face. If you say, you know what, I, I made a mistake, and they come back and say, yeah, but you did. you're right, I said I made a mistake. Uh, there was an old pastor when I first started 
who told me as a young pastor, when you come in conflict with other people, he said, think old dog, or big dog, little dog. And I did about what you're doing now. <laughs> well, what do you mean by that? He said, if a big dog comes across a little dog, the little dog has three options. What are they? He can take off and try to run. What's going to happen? Big dog going to catch him, chomp him. He can stand there and try to fight. What's going to happen? Same thing. He's going to get chomped. Or he can lay down, roll over a bear's neck. The big dog will sniff around a little bit, say, yeah, I'm all that. And he'll turn around and walk off. The little dog lives to see another day. He says, as a pastor, whenever you're in conflict, always assume you're the little dog. Right there is a price of admission. That was worth it right there. <laughs> Big dog, little dog. Always assume you're a little dog. Doesn't mean you got to be walked all over. But there's no point in making a fight in a big scene trying to cover your own tracks. Own it. Lay down, roll over, and say, you're right. After they sniff around, they bark a little bit, they'll walk off. And then you let it go. Okay? Did we cover them all? All right. We're going to have refreshments in just a little bit. And uh, here's what I want you to do during refreshment time. I want you to find at least four people and ask them what their best leadership trait is and what their worst leadership trait is and what they'd like to learn, how they'd like to, to build that. Find out their name, what chapter they're from. So I'm saying, don't do it with people you know already. Okay, I want you to meet other people. <laughs> Best leadership trait, the one they find is the weakest leadership trait. Does that make sense? Now, we're going to have a bunch of little Debbies over here. We're going to have hot chocolate. And we're going to have apple cider and that kind of stuff. And there's some other water bottles if you just want that. So... What I want you to do is go get all that stuff first. Is that fair? Yeah. And then take some time and do that, and then we'll close off the evening, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about what's going to happen there. Yes, sir? We don't have to remember all this information, do we? There'll be a test in the morning. 